Hello, everyone, and welcome to this panel presentation. Uh, it is hosted by the National Goose Protection Coalition, which is a project of indefensive animals. And my name is Lisa Levinson. I help to um, steer our committee. <laughs> and we also have some wonderful uh, panelists today. We're presenting this panel on how to strategies to uh, stop goose roundups, which is an issue that all of us are facing in our communities. And we hope that this resource of which is a panel of experts who have been working in this field for different amounts of time, but they all have their own expertise that they're going to be sharing. So we're very excited to present this information and it will begin with more of a uh, presentation by each one of our panelists and then it will move into a Q&A. And we will end on time because we have the unique feature of having the presidential uh, debates immediately following this. So again, thanks to everyone for joining. So what we have on our schedule today, we have our very first presenter. I'm going to let each presenter introduce themselves because it'll be part of their story. And then they're going to share with you their top strategies for uh, preventing or stopping or managing the fallout from these uh, goose roundups. And one thing we all have in common is our uh, love of animals, and particularly geese. We're all here to protect them and to be their advocates. So Joyce, I would love it if you could start us off tonight with um, your expertise and, and your top strategies. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Joyce Danheim. Uh, I live in Greenwood Lake, New York, which is sort of mid-state, upstate New York. Michelle Schenker and I are co-directors of the Committee for Humane Beast Control. We sort of formed organically uh, in 2018 when they did a goose roundup on our lake. Um, and we filmed, it. well, Michelle filmed it and took pictures. We had no idea what was going on at that time. Um, we have the unique distinction of being a bi-state lake which is half of our lake is in New York, where Michelle and I live, and half of it is in New Jersey, which has really complicated things for us in many ways, um, because the two states can never agree on anything. But to our animals, it's one body of lake, and they don't know if they're on the New Jersey side or the New York side. They go everywhere. So they did form about 10 years ago this bi-state commission, which is commissioned. They're volunteers or commissioners from New York and New Jersey, representing both sides to try to come up with a cohesive plan to act as stewards for the lake. I don't have to give you my comments and how feckless they've been in that area, but needless to say, they, the Green Lake Commission um, hired the USDA Wildlife Services in 2018 to round up our geese and goslings. Um, and since that moment, we mobilized um, there are four of us originally, and we formed the Committee for Humane Geese Control. And the first thing we did is get ourselves educated on geese behavior, USDA. We, we used the geese peace methods, and they were a wealth of information and education for us. And we formed an alliance with the Animal Protection League of New Jersey, um, Humane Society of the United States, PETA, our local shelters, and we got a lot of community volunteers. We rallied our community behind us. Our lake is a nine mile long lake. Just to give you an idea of the landscape, it's made almost every inch of it is made up of either residents, marinas, restaurants, a couple of public parks, and some private beaches. There's very little open land, and there's a couple of islands in the middle. And the ends of our lakes happen to be very shallow, where geese and swans like to eat on the, 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 the weeds that fill up there every year, which actually in that regard, they're good for the lake. Um, so we've been attending these Greenwood Lake Commission meetings ever since and asking the hard questions, their scientific methods for determining why Roundup was necessary. And we put in FOIA requests and we did, we reached out to our community and our politicians and we presented an alternate alternative solution, uh, which is uh, we, which is addling eggs and site aversion. We're a group of volunteers and we put a plan in place and we took action on that plan in 2019. We started addling eggs 
and putting some site aversion strategies in place, reaching out to some key spots on the lake. The objection to the geese on our lake is the goose poop. But uh, one of the things we've found, and I'm sure you've found it as well, is that people like to complain about the geese. But when it comes to actually putting up a makeshift fence or planting some shrubs or something, they actually don't want to do that. Um, so we've been trying to educate people on those silly balloons and the, the fake coyotes and the stuff that doesn't work. And we've been trying to work with key spots in marinas and residents and some private associations around the lake um, to try to present some value to the community. We Luckily, we have the support of our mayor, but we have the other mayor on the New Jersey side of the lake that we have to deal with too. And getting those two to agree on things has been a challenge. Um, despite the efforts we did in 2019, the Green Lake Commission signed another contract with the USDA for addling and killing the geese. And as we all know, that's just a waste of money because it's a temporary fix. The, the first summer, there were a lot less geese on the lake. And they estimated there were 350 geese on the lake, which is not a lot for a nine mile lake. lake. But they rounded up and killed over 200 of them. But that first summer, there were very few geese on the lake. And the next summer, as we all know, once their void is created in nature, new geese will come in. We live underneath the Atlantic Flyway here. There's always going to be new geese. And we also live in a part of New York State where in a 50 mile radius, there's tons of other bodies of water. And we all know that geese are pond hoppers. So the number fluctuates, but we've been able to keep the number down to below 200 at high season. So um, our goal has been to reduce the amount of resident geese and to deter and teach the molting geese that come in here that this is not a safe place for you. You can't find food here. This is a work in progress, getting the community to cooperate with us. We've gotten a do not feed the waterfowl um, ordinance passed. Getting people to follow it is another issue. We've been trying to educate, gotten signs put up. We've instituted a dog walking program at the couple of public parks we have, and that's been working very well with volunteers. They have permission to access the park early in the morning and in the evening. So they have badges made up and liability forms registered with our town hall. Um, we've done some site selection where we've actually picked sites and gone out and done a site survey and come back and made recommendations. We've actually installed a couple of fences and done a couple of things uh, as well, even though, you know, our real goal is we're, we, don't, we're, we don't know how to handle a drill or a, but we, we, we made it work. And we've been doing constantly surveys of the lake all around the lake, counting geese. So we have an idea of how many geese are on the lake at a certain time, because somebody will say, oh, I saw 12 geese the other day. Yes, this is their na natural habitat. There's always gonna be geese here. We live under the Atlantic Flyway. Geese are gonna stop by on migration or pond hop, looking for some food. As long as they can find food here, they're gonna come here. So we've been trying to teach the geese as well as the community that um, what we can do, because it's really not going to work unless you get your local politicians and the community behind you. As I said, this is a work in progress and we keep going. But we got them to cancel their contract with the USDA because they had seen the work we've been doing and they, seen, they saw um, that we had been taking action. And this, believe me, yeah. The amount of time Michelle and I and the other two ladies have put into this, this could be a full-time job sometimes. It, we put a lot of work into this, um, writing plans. We wrote a, a strategic plan for 2020 and for 2021 already. And we've been, we've been spending a lot of time trying to educate people. Not that we're experts, but all of a sudden, we're the only experts on our lake. So um, we've been trying to, you know, to share that with the community and it's only going to work if the community takes heed. So we've made a lot of progress. We still have much more to go. Um, the first year, um, we did the, only the addling on the New York side and they, their compromise of the USDA is that they would pay them to addle on the New Jersey side. They paid the USDA $10,000 to addle um, three nests. And um, we found more than that. And the nests that they found, the, the, the geese had already hatched. 
they didn't come to like mid-May. And you know, that's, that's too, it's too late and it's too inhumane. We will not addle uh, past a certain date because the first few weeks, the, um, the egg is more like a chicken egg, but the last two weeks when the chick comes out of the sack, we won't add up. We, we, we were trying to do this humanely. Believe me, Adeline's not a fun job. It's, all, it's horrible. But if we don't do it, we felt that all of our geese were in jeopardy of being rounded up, and their goslings have rounded up and killed. So we had to demonstrate that we were willing to take action. And we've done that two years in a row. We've made some progress. Um, we, they did not put up a contract for 2020. Um, we've actually kept the communication line open with them. What started out as a very contentious relationship, um, we put a lot of pressure on them. And our local um, Animal Protection League of New Jersey, these people were wonderful. They put so much pressure on these guys. And uh, believe me, it was the strength and the alliances that we formed and the community feedback. I mean, there were some very contentious meetings. I actually thought they were gonna call the police on some people, not us. But, um, but anyway, we decided we need to work with them, keep the communication line open. And that's what we've been doing. And our mayor, and we've been going around and marketing ourselves, touting our accomplishments, taking credit for absolutely everything. Uh, this year was a little challenging because as we know, we had the virus. And we had to start looking for the goose nests around March 20th. Almost every goose had nested by March 30th and we lost our volunteers because it was a lockdown and social distancing, but we got it done with a very small number of us. We also had the Boy Scouts, which our mayor um, connected us with. They have their own liability. They have their own kayaks and canoes. It was something that the Boy Scout leaders thought would be perfect for them, but with the lockdown, they weren't able to help us. But we got the job done. We missed a few nests. And our goal is we're not here to wipe out every goose on this lake. There's always going to be geese here, uh, whether they're resident geese or pond hopping geese or migrating geese. And that's what we tell everybody. That's how we end every conversation, every meeting we have with everyone. And um, we also have demonstrated that rounding up geese is a waste of money and it's a short-term fix, and it's inhumane. I mean, they spent $25,000 killing over 200 geese and of our taxpayer money. And you know, we, we tell everybody that, um, yes, it's, you see geese, there's going to be geese. I, Michelle and I both live lakefront. There's geese on my property almost every day. The last two years has been a lot less of them, but they come here every other day. I figured out a way to compromise with them. I pick up I have a cleaning system. I pick it up. It's very easy. They live here too. And that's what we have to teach people. This is not a human's world. It's this world belongs to everybody. And people, as you know, don't want to coexist with animals. Teaching people that may be futile, but teaching them to coexist and making sure that our government does not pick up the phone and call people to come and kill any animal on our lake. We just went through a very similar situation with the swans. And believe me, it was a coalition of in defense of animals and all of you waterfowl experts that put pressure on them. They got over 500 letters, even from Australia. And uh, we definitely unglued one of the commissioners, but he deserved to be unglued. <laughs> so, Joyce, just a little note about the time. We're gonna wrap up um, shortly. Okay. I'm finished, basically. I just want to say that with the proper Adelaide and site aversion and education with the community, this is a much better approach. I think we've proved that and we still have work to do. We've written the 2021 plan and um, that incorporates the Boy Scouts to help us with the Adelaide part. And um, we're looking forward to being successful um, in years to come. Um, we're hoping that we can integrate some of these programs into the community that will do them instead of us because you know um i'm pushing 70 getting in a kayak at in the end of march is a little bit difficult but we're making progress but it's it's not something that's going to be fixed in a couple of years well thank you so much joyce for sharing your you're actually one of our success stories and we love to hear yes, the positive news from you i can't thank you all enough every single one of you for the help you've given us it's 
we are so much stronger now than when we were going through this beast thing on our own because of all of you. So thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move to our next speaker. We have Carol Woodall. And again, I'll let her do her own introduction and uh, share her uh, top strategies and her perspective. Thank you. Oh, might need to unmute. <laughs> I apologize. So thank you very much, Lisa, for coordinating all of us here. I think so many of us, we only know each other by our name as opposed to never having the opportunity to engage. So I'm going to present a little bit from um, my perspective, which is attached to Canada Geese Protection Colorado's efforts taking place in um, the Denver metro area. So I'm going to share um, a small presentation to try to keep me on task. I want to, okay, host to say, can you, I think you have to enable screen sharing. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Let me try it again. Got it. Yep. Yep, okay. Give it a try. Sounds good. So what I want to say from the outset is that from, from my perspective, listening to Joyce, it's been so incredibly instructive because she has really tapped on um, issues and concerns related to how do you build community engagement? How do you raise awareness? How do you start to do this kind of coalition building? And also recognizing that patience and perseverance and integrity in the project is absolutely necessary. So Joyce has 10 years under her belt of doing this kind of activism. And I only have a year and a couple of months because oh, it seems as though we always start, right, at the moment when the roundup occurs in our vicinity. And then we start this very steep learning curve. So Canada Geese Protection Colorado was formed in 2019 because of the roundup. It ended up forming just a couple of weeks after the community at large became aware of what had occurred in various parks throughout the city of Denver, three weeks after the actual roundup had taken place. So there was a lag of time before we were aware. And so I think sort of what I want to do is focus in on not just the non-lethal strategies. I think there are other individuals in terms of the panelists who will be covering those strategies, but thinking in terms of if the goal is to reach the point where non-lethal humane methods are being employed, directed toward wildlife management or engagement, be that with the geese or other wildlife that happen to inhabit our lake and park systems, then how do we do that effectively? And what I ended up starting off with is the fact that we had no information. We did not know what was going on. And so when we ended up having our very first rally, which was two weeks after we became aware of the roundup. So the rally or the protest happened roughly around the second week of July, and it was two weeks after we became aware in terms of we, i.e. the public at large, that a roundup had occurred, and that was roughly June 27th. So at that point, starting off our narrative, what we knew was that there's a transparency issue and there's an accountability issue. And that's the only thing that we knew. We did not have any documents. So. Um, in terms of this description that I have for it, I think the words that I have highlighted are where we are now, where we've been able to reach. And that is focusing on the ideas of transparency, accountability, equitability, in terms of these processes of public engagement. We have public engagement, if we have more seats at the table, then maybe we'll be able to move forward with more impactful um, ways in which our wildlife are engaged with. And so um, the next slide is just to sort of look at what that felt like over this past year. So 
Joy saying that it's a process. It's a process. Part of that process was understanding what the documents are, making sure that we had gathered the depredation permits, the cooperative service agreements between the city of Denver as well as with USDA, making sure that we had the um, goose management programs, that we had the goose management programs for Colorado Wildlife Services, any kinds of documents that were actually contributing to the situation around the roundups. We also needed to get a sense of who the social players were, who had signed the contracts, how much were the contracts for, um, were the, was the public involved, was the public not involved, was the city council and consequently the Parks and Rec's advisory board involved and aware or were they not? All of these questions were just trying to figure out the lay of the land. Um, who were the players at the state level as well, as well as the federal level in terms of the director. So one very interesting note is that in 2010, Martin Loney, who was the then director overseeing the roundups that were taking place in the New York, New Jersey area, and consequently, he then ended up relocating and took up the very exact same position here in Colorado. So he is the director of the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services for the Colorado branch and is overseeing. And it's important to actually keep track of who the players are at the federal level because it also provides you with a way of understanding the institutional structure of USDA. Because what we're trying to do at the local level, it's resonating at the state level, it's resonating at the federal level, it's also resonating in terms of the ways in which the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is in the process of being gutted or whether or not it's being enforced. So when I say even sort of keep track of the documents. It's not only the municipal documents, it's also how it's resonating at the federal level. And that's how all of us happen to be connected because we are all connected because USDA APHIS Wildlife Services is overseeing the various roundups at the level of public land or private land. So keeping track of those actors is crucial. And then you also want to start keeping track, and Joyce already ended up mentioning it, because some of these narratives or claims or the ways in which the geese are being positioned, it's very similar. So that's not necessarily going to be something that is an anomaly. It's directed towards what is visible. What is visible is the poop. It's not about the content of the poop. It's the quantity of the poop. What's going to happen after the roundup takes place in terms of the distribution of the meat? Is it going to be presented and distributed to individuals who are food insecure? And if so, is it going to be tested? So all of these things, it's a matter of keeping track of the narratives. And then once you start to assemble, you can start speaking out individually or collectively. And I would say even in terms of what we've experienced, there was an element this past year of individuals who were consistent in speaking out. And COVID actually presented a really wonderful opportunity because people were able to weigh in at the city council as well as at um, the Parks and Rec's advisory board level in quantity. So all of a sudden with COVID, we were protected, but our voices grew. And so that was an advantage. Um, the next thing in terms of what we've been trying to do is keeping track of transparency and accountability. What I would recommend is to go to whatever website, just try to keep track of what a working definition is at your municipal or local level. If there is no document, in terms of a definition for transparency and accountability, then start asking. Because transparency, you need to have a starting definition. According to Welcome to Transparent Denver, transparency is defined as access to information about what is really happening. Okay, and then we think, what does that actually mean? It's about informing the public, not establishing a dialogue. And then the next definition, which is important, is accountability, ways to hold decision makers accountable for the decisions we make. And if, according to the documents around goose management program, which is what we found, is that in the 2019 program, it specifically stated that public support was necessary before a lethal take. 
it was stated. There was no meaningful public engagement along that lines. In 2020, the Goose Management Program had eliminated that very necessity of having public support. So keeping track, just doing a, a search find all of where is public support? Is it necessary? Isn't it necessary? And then we have to be able to create a space for public engagement. Um, how much time do I have, Lisa? I think we're coming close, <laughs> coming close to wrapping up. Okay, so, um, so I want to start with transparency is a definition that I've been working with to try to explain to our officials. And that is, as transparency establishes a process of engagement, and that process is important for people who do not have power. And people who do not have power mean individuals whose voices have been silenced across the board, no matter what kind of location or municipality or demographic you might live in. And so I think the one last thing that I want to state, and I can also provide, I can send this to you, Lisa, if this would be useful, is to also try to understand what are the various branches and who are the decision makers. And then since this is a process, then start to decide where are you going to spend your time for that first year of engagement? Because it's really crucial to start to establish allies, a working relationship with someone. Because it's not that the public is unaware of just how complicated these issues are. Sometimes our officials are also unaware because our officials might also have not been informed about the process. And so it's working at two different levels. So in order for our allies, say at the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, to be able to have an understanding of how complicated this issue is, they need to be put in the position and given the time to understand therefore to be able to provide oversight. And so I think what I want to end with is something in terms of how do we hold decision makers accountable? We have to attend meetings regularly. We have to contribute to the public record by consistent messaging. Also, when we speak at meetings, then you type up your statement, you can elaborate and send it to the secretary or whoever the minute maker is at the stated function and make sure that you ask, please include my statement as part of the public record. You need to document and record. Part of holding our officials accountable is making sure we understand how they're using language because language is crucial. We need to be persistent, patient, radically listening to our officials at the same time in order to determine where is there a space for effective and meaningful collaboration. And I always like to start from the standpoint of compassion. I don't want to assume that a person who might ostensibly be perceived as not willing to collaborate, I want to make, I want to start from the standpoint that I want to bring them into a conversation first. I don't want to assume that I understand what it looks like for them. So I'm trying not to put someone into the defensive. And then always just trying to operate from a sense of integrity about the project that we're doing, which ultimately is about protecting our wildlife. Wonderful. That's it. Thank you so much, Carol. We really appreciate your perspective and expertise, even though it has been a short time. You've really learned so much in this time, and it's very valuable information. So let's see. I think next up we've got Arlene Steinberg. Will you take a moment and introduce yourself? Okay. Do I, uh, will I automatically come onto the main screen? Yes, you will. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I, I just see me on the top right now. Um, anyway, most of you know me because I probably was your main contact source for yes. some of this information. Yes, yes. I, uh, I, I just kind of fell on, I've always been an animal lover, but about 15 years ago, I got involved with geese. I, I remember a time when you didn't even see Canada geese anywhere. Uh, they were very rare and they were magnificent things. Uh, and all of a sudden now they're killing them. So I got involved with that. And, and actually that's how I got involved with the swan 
issue as well, doing research for geese. I'm a digger. I'll go online. I will dig. I will find. And I will self-educate myself about anything I want to know. So, um, and, and once I educate myself, I, I happen to be reasonably good at writing. And, and I will just get out there and I will disseminate information to everybody who wants it, who needs it. Uh, uh, along the way, I, I've made some connections with some advantageous uh, conservation experts. And, you know, it, it's an education process all the way around. What I learn, I pass along. Um, it's, it, it, what, what both Joyce said and what Carol said are very true. And, and oddly enough, they're working with two different groups in a way. And these are the most prevalent groups uh, that you will have to contend with. One is uh, municipal governments. Uh, ultimately, the, the source is always government, federal, whatever. But the two main groups that we have um, problems with are municipal governments and HOAs, homeowners associations. Um, homeowners associations in particular are problematic because these are people who often get in those positions because nobody else wants them. I, I, I'm president of my condo because nobody else wants this job. I happen to be good at it and, and I happen to care because I also live here, but I'm probably one of the few homeowners people that factors the animals in as much as the people. They live here too. Sometimes the animals need protection from people who would harm them. So what I find with most homeowners is a lot of them are not qualified even to have those positions. They're, they're usually men, not always, but they're often men who are financially responsible. So they get put in these positions because they, they may know how to have oversight on spending, but they, there's very rarely ever anybody on a homeowners association who knows anything about the wildlife or the pets that live there. Uh, and, and that's a problem. To me, there should be a requirement among homeowners associations that someone must be wildlife friendly and somewhat aware. And, and I don't mean from the government end of it, because they have a different agenda going. And it's the same thing in a way with, with government municipal agencies. The problem for, with them is that their wildlife go-to is usually the DNR, or whatever your local or state uh, animal association uh, group is, and, and they're gonna represent the government. And the government, unfortunately, has a tendency to kill. Why? Because they make money doing it. They, they make not millions killing geese across this country. They make billions killing geese. It, it, it's literally become a cash cow. And that's why they cultivate uh, communities and they, they encourage people to hate them uh, because they want to get the public on board with killing them. Another way that they'll do it is to tell them they're giving the food away to the poor. The poor don't want to eat geese. And, and we don't need to kill our wildlife to feed the poor. There, there's, there's healthy food available for them. There's, there's no reason to do that. So part of the problem is uh, we have to change the dynamic with, with these groups. With homeowners people, we have to get to them um, with humane alternatives before they turn to the government, because the government will kill. These are career people. Somebody mentioned uh, Martin La La Lowry. Uh, he's a career government official. There's a Barbara Avers in um, oh. Michigan, and, and she's a nightmare. Uh, these are people who their, their lives are, and they lie. They're, 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 uh, Karen, when she does her presentation, will tell you when it comes to um, certain animals, they pass along information from one state to the other. They, the states don't even do their own research. Um, so part of the problem is getting communities to start with a humane method. And once they do that and have success with it, because these programs do work, They'll never need to go to killings. But of course, the government doesn't want that to happen because there goes their cash cow. So, you know, but on the other hand, where does the money come from? It's your tax money. 
Now, I don't know what's going to happen going forward with money in this country, because right now it's all going to uh, curing a virus and nobody's going to be paying taxes because nobody's got a job right now. So, you know, money's going to be a problem. They're really going to waste money on killing beasts now. They're, this is a prime time to, to use what we're learning and, and get people on board with trying humane methods first. And part of the way to do that is, as, as somebody said, very few people even know this kind of thing is going on until they find out about a goose kill in their own community. And then they're shocked. I've known about this for 15 years, but to somebody who never had a goose kill before last year, they had no idea this has been going on for years and years. So one of the things that's ideal for people is to get involved with your uh, town councils. People really should take an interest in what goes on in their own town and go to meetings. That's where these things get buried when a community is going to do this. It's never going to be in the newspaper until it's already been done. So part of the thing that people need to do is to start going to your town council meetings. And if, especially if you hear any rumblings that people don't like geese, there's too much geese, whatever, something's going to be happening if they're starting to hear that. So you start to go and, and form groups of like-minded people. Get a team, in a, in a perfect world, you will do this before they get to the point of killing. In most places, this happens after the first killing. And in a lot of places, either within a, a year or two, nobody's killing anymore because the group has formed a committee, they've educated themselves and gotten information from people like us, which forwards things on. And, um, and, and once we're educated as to what is going on and what is happening, and, and part of the key is we ideally should form allies with the people that we're going to be enemies with and try to get them on board with us to see there's an alternative and the alternative is going to make you look good as well as solve your problem. You start killing, you are always going to kill. You are, and, and communities that killed for years, maybe when they switch over to doing um, a humane methods, within a year or two, they are never going back to killing again because it works better. It doesn't split the community. It doesn't, the community doesn't fight over it. Most people don't even know anything about the animals that they live right next to. People move to a lake and, and want to get rid of all the wildlife there. It, it, it enjoys this community. A nine mile lake, nine miles of lake. And the people, the people there don't want any wildlife on it. I mean, that's just insane. So education is key to this. You have to educate some people that this is where these animals belong. They enrich our lives and, you know, and, and the material is out there. And hopefully with, with our group, we'll, one of the things that's been lacking was a source where people could go for information and find it. I, I put together a manual that I've been mailing out. It'll now be posted on our page, but people didn't even know where to go before. And that's why communities turn to the government at first. So Arlene, we'll need to wrap it up just shortly. Sure. Um, now, basically, I'm, I'm kind of um, uh, like the uh, facilitator. I mean, if people find out they need something, I, I've got things put together. I can connect people with, this is what I'm good at. It's like, oh, these people have geese. This is a, this is a person over here who's got something that will help these. People. That's what I do. You guys did all the work, half of which I sent you, but you were the boots. One. And that's the other thing. We can provide the information, but it's the boots on the ground that makes the program work in your town. Thank you so much, Arlene. You have just helped many, many of us along the way. So we're very grateful to you. So I'd like to check in and see if Betty, um, I'm just seeing if you can unmute yourself. I believe you can press star six if you're on the phone. And if you're not able to unmute yourself, we may go ahead and have Karen uh, share next, and then we'll come back to you, um, Betty. So you would need to press star six 
to on the phone, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay. And so, Karen, would you like to? Can you oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Uh, I appeared you, from Betty. the depths of the phone. Yes, okay. you did. And we would I, I, I honestly think the three uh, that preceded me were excellent. And uh, I've been in this for 22 plus years. And I am honestly, very honestly, very impressed uh, with uh, what is proceeding at this time. The only thing I could really add what I am trying to do at this point in time after all of these years. And would you believe it? 1998, I held a multi-state. That was when I first heard of the killing. I uh, convened a multi-state day-long conference to try and stop the killing. So that just puts it into perspective as to how many years or how ineffective I have been. But it, I've been involved for that long a time. Sad to say. At this point in time, I am working with an attorney, and I had spoken with Lisa about this. And what we are doing is presenting. Nothing can go through litigation as we have been advised. So we're providing the information and gathering um, just the past 22 years, the beginning, the middle, and where we stood as far as 2018 is concerned. And we found in accumulating and gathering all of the information that we are killing more geese and spending more money in 2018 than we did in 2000. When I asked for, they had done a, a roundup and killing in Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge. And I just opened the contract to see how it read, wanting to find who had signed the contract to pay. And it was $9.2 million contract to kill for three years. That initiated me then to ask the attorney I had been working with through the years, let's pull the contracts for just one year in the state of New Jersey. We chose 2018. So let's see how many contracts were completed in 2018. He calls me back after two days, the attorney, and he said, what did you ask for? I said, you know what I asked for? I asked for all the contracts for one year. He said, they need more time. I said, well, this is getting more sad and more interesting as we go. Long story short, one year's contracts, 2018, the average contract three to five pages long, was 558 pages hard printed on both sides of the paper. That's how many contracts for killing in the state of New Jersey for one year. And that's what we're up against. And, and as Arlene said it exactly as it is, until we stop the dollar sign, we will not stop the killing. And it boils down to what I call a cottage industry. The geese are, along with the New Jersey, the white-tailed deer and the black bear, but especially the geese, they are the cash cow. And until we take away the dollar sign, and I think the only way to do it is to make sure that every citizen in every community knows where their taxpayer-based dollars are going. And that's basically where it begins and ends. You there, Lisa? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Betty. This is a unique perspective, and we really wanted for Betty to be able to speak to everyone because she's gathered so much data on this and she will be putting together a website as a resource so that other communities can actually use this data uh, for reference when they are trying to um, work within their own their own areas. So thank you, Betty, for sharing. You're welcome. That. So now we'd like to um, speak with Karen. I know you've got Hello. your own perspective and I thought you might be able to share it with us. Hello, everybody. Um, I don't know why I'm not on there, but 
You are on here. We can see you. You can see. Okay. Um, well, I started back in like 2008 when the DNR did an illegal goose roundup on, um, I work for the township here and they did an illegal goose roundup on our nature park. So, um, I was taking a lot of pictures at the time, um, kind of like an amateur photographer and I would go there like every day and take pictures and stuff. And I noticed the geese were gone and there were a couple that I really liked there and, and, uh, they were gone and they were injured. So um, I got on the phone with the DNR and they basically told me that um, they had a permit and the permit was from the condos that live on the nature park that don't own the nature park. And they decided, you know, that I said, didn't you look at their application to see, you know, even to look to see if that was their property. And they said, we don't have the manpower. So we got a, our attorneys involved and everything and, and everything was redacted, everything we asked for. Um, so that really made me, you know, want to fight harder against them. So, so every year, um, this year we were lucky because um, they didn't do roundups because of COVID. And the Michigan DNR, un, it's unbelievable, but um, they don't kill them. They just round them up and they take them to state game land where they can be hunted. So here in Michigan, they make a lot of money doing the roundups. Um, everything's money. I mean, swans, everything, everything's money. So they got, um, they do the roundups, they make money, they make like $200 on a permit. Um, then you got to figure they go to state game land. So they're making money on the hunting. Um, you got to park. So they got to pay the parking pass, all that, you know, so they're making, they're making a lot of money. Um, and they they brought in this guy, Joe Johnson. He's a he was with the Kellogg's Institute. He's dead now. Um, but he, um, he's responsible for bringing the resident Canada goose to Michigan. And they got an award for it, a conservation award for it. And um, so, so, I mean, they're bringing, the DNR is probably like the worst at managing anything. They bring, they bring stuff in, they make it sound like they're horrible, and then they got to hunt it. And people, you know, and they think the DNR is great because, you know, we voted for them to take care of our wildlife. And um, so they're just, uh, they're, they're terrible, <laughs> but, um, and they're not very transparent. They'll go out at like five, five in the morning and they'll go out and they'll round the geese up and they get the people on the lake that hate the geese, which, you know, around here with all the lakes we have, a lot of people don't like the geese. So they're all out there in their boats. I've got um, video. I went out and took video. It's, it's very hard to watch and to do it but it's good to put it out there on youtube and you know if you do have like an uh a community like an hoa or something you know it's good maybe to put it on their website and things like people don't want to see themselves in a boat rounding up geese so um i've also um like with the park every year we try i try and keep an eye on that to make sure that these condos aren't pulling a permit and, um, and when I did find out that they did, I used the media. I, I got people to call like our local news stations and they were right there, you know, and they, they go around, they interview the people that live there and then they interview people at the nature park. And so it works out because they, they've stopped it every year in the township because I think it's, a lot of it's because I work there, but they, um, they don't allow them. They said they can never do a roundup there, but they still try. Um, I've, contacted the tow and collect people. They do um, uh, the machines that pick up goose poop. And I thought, I was telling Lisa earlier, I thought they would be more, you know, wanting to get their flyers out there and things, but they did send me like CDs and, um, and told about the company. So I would go around to different um, like apartment complexes and condos and, you know, stuff like that where you know, they have all these nice ponds and they don't want any geese. So I, you know, I would give them those and I don't know if they ever bought them, bought the machines or not, but, you know, I know at least I tried, you know, to give them another option. Um, I do, right now I've got some swan petitions out there, but when, when this all started back in, you know, 2008 and everything, we did goose um, petitions and, and the petitions, I mean, they don't, People don't, you know, a lot of the officials, you know, that you send them to, I, they probably just blow them off. But they're good because, like, for instance, with Joyce, 
um, you know, I put it on my petition site and I had like 15,000, almost 15,000 signatures on that petition site. And, you know, like she said, she got people from Australia. I don't know if that's from my petition site or not, but I know, I know when they were going to um, kill swans here in one of the communities, I put something out there and they said they got call, you know, calls and, and letters from all over the world. And, um, and that made a big difference because they, they didn't kill the swans on their lakes. So, um, so even though you think, you know, they, they might not work for getting the attention of like the DNR or something, you know, it is good because you can put updates on them and, you know, hopefully people look at them and, you know, may want to reach out and, and call these people. Um, uh, let's see. And just want to let you know we're coming a little bit towards the end, so. Okay, well, I mean, I, that's pretty much it, I guess. I mean, I do do FOIAs. Um, I always try and find out how many they've killed, where they're killing. So like the next year I can put something out on like Facebook or something and say, hey, you know, these are the lakes that are killing. Um, you know, that kind of thing, you know, or, or rounding them up or whatever. Um, uh, so, so that they work too. Um, and it's good to know how much, how many they are, you know, rounding up and, and uh, taking to these state game areas to be hunted. And the DNR knows, I mean, when we talk to them and they know the program doesn't work. They know that the, pe the, the geese that don't get shot and killed during hunting season go back to the same lakes. And, uh, and they just know it's a money maker, so they don't they don't deter it. You know, they tell them they got to have their their um, deterrence and all that. They don't check any of that. I mean, they don't check anything. They don't. Somebody just somebody at an apartment complex told me, oh, we we tell them we do an egg roundup or an egg and then a nest destruction, but you know, we go and we get like one egg and then we tell them we got one egg and then it's fine. We get the permit to round them up. And so so DNR doesn't care. They just want to make the money. That's all they're about. And they know people don't care either. That's right. The, the people that hate that hate something yeah. are going to get rid of it. They don't care. So. so thank you very much, Karen, for sharing your perspective. And what we've had tonight is these different perspectives. And I hope that everyone who's been tuning in and listening has found um, one or two that work for you. And if you have questions and you'd like to question. reach out yes there is a question so we'll handle that in just a moment um, but I wanted to let everybody know because some people may want to um, uh, move on at the top of the hour that you can reach out to um, in defense of animals and I can also share the questions with this panel you can reach out to uh, geese at idausa.org and that way any questions that aren't answered during our time tonight can get answered. So let's go ahead and we'll give give one one of our questions that we've seen here um, and Anna is asking is there a strategy to look for goose nests and we have just a couple minutes if anyone yes. wants to answer that. Yes. Joyce? Yes. Um Actually, um, geese pair off, maybe a little different in different areas, around February. They pick their mate, and um, you'll see them pairing off from the flock. You'll see a lot of them in trees. Now, not every uh, mated pair will mate because they have to be about three years old to actually produce uh, offspring. But what we look for is we look for area where two geese may be frequenting a lot. We go out on boats and kayaks and on people on foot and we, we note areas where there's two geese frequenting that area. And then um, March 30th is really the date that our geese, everybody's nested. The mother goes to sit on the nest. We give her about a week to lay all the eggs because I think they lay an egg every day or every other day or something like that. And then we look for the lone goose. That's when we look for the lone goose because the sentinel, he acts as guarding the nest. He may stray a hundred feet either way, but you'll see the lone goose and that will lead you to the nest. That has been the key for us. And we've also um, found, been successful with most of our nests in really swampy, marshy, shallow areas. And, but the lone goose always, leave. that's when you know the mother's on the nest, she's laying her eggs. And we've also noticed that the mother's got to eat too, so she may come off the nest for a little while with her mate and feed and go back on the nest. But look for the lone goose, that's the key. 
Thank you very much, Joyce. We really appreciate your expertise. Mm -hmm. So we do, we did have a few more questions, but I know we are at the top of the hour and I wanted to respect our, um, our many people who were interested in, in uh, continuing to watch the presidential candidates uh, do their debating, which is happening very shortly. So first I wanted to thank everyone for joining us and thank all of the panelists for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we totally appreciate it. And for the people who've joined in, I know that there's many, uh, many of you are experts as well. So we hope to hear from you and perhaps a future future panel. And for anyone who um, has questions and didn't get them answered tonight, um, please feel free to reach out to geese at idausa.org. We will send it out to the panelists and then we'll send you back an answer to those questions. So again, thank you very much to everyone who's joined us and to our panelists. And um, we know that a big part of it is getting the word out and speaking with one another. That is going to uh, ensure that this, these strategies become implemented in different communities and we can actually start a nationwide movement to stop these goose roundups. There's no, no need to continue funding this um, at the taxpayer expense. So here we are working together as a united coalition to end the roundups and I want to thank everybody for being part of that. So we hope that you guys have a wonderful evening and thank you so much for tuning in. And please thank stay in you, touch Lisa. with us. Thank, thank you. you.